Good morning, at least Pacific time, not legal advice, but it is legal experience and you're coming along for the ride. Um, what you can do for me is subscribe, like, and share. Please do so, and I would really thank you for doing that. Um, so as you know, I filed an action against Fidelity, FINRA, and the DTCC. Originally, it was in the state court in California, and then it was removed, which is permissible, by FINRA to federal court in Los Angeles, and that's where we are now. There have been three complaints filed. Early on, I tried to get an injunction in state court. I initiated discovery against Fidelity in state court, but that was stayed, uh, in other words, stopped by rule once the action was removed by FINRA to federal court. Since we've been in federal court, I've informally have asked for blue sheets and other items from defendants in the federal court and asked them for a discovery conference to get discovery moving. As a discovery conference is somewhat discretionary, they've re refused that request to date, and um, perhaps that'll change in the future. We shall see. Each of the defendants filed motions to dismiss on March 15, 2023. So there were three motions to dismiss, and Fidelity also filed a motion to compel arbitration. Motions to dismiss are basically kind of procedural motions, procedural maneuvers, whereby, in essence, for whatever reason, defendants are claiming that plaintiff has no case or cannot prevail on that particular case. Doesn't mean that plaintiff may not be able to prevail on another case or other claims, but as to this particular case, the claim is for some reason that uh, the plaintiff cannot prevail. In this case, plaintiff is me and, and you. It's somewhat different, somewhat different from Fidelity because Fidelity's position is that any um, dispute with them should be done in private FINRA arbitration. And I will deal with uh, that in another uh, video that I'll probably do either later on today or tomorrow on the arbitration aspect. But so it's somewhat different. So FINRA and DTCC are looking to end the case entirely. Fin, uh, Fidelity really wants it to be heard in a FINRA-related arbitration. And there's pluses and minuses with that. Again, I'll deal with that uh, in a later video. On March 17th, I had an email exchange and with Fidelity, uh, actually counsel for Fidelity, and amongst other things referenced the FAQ of FINRA that I received on March 16th and asked them how they, me asking Fidelity's counsel, how Fidelity would deal with the short positions, how would they, how would they would close them, and also, I'm glad I asked this question, if they had shorts transferred to Nextbridge. And the reason why I thought that was a good question, I'm gonna pat myself on the back, was because on the 21st, that was seemingly confirmed that they had in fact moved short positions into Nextbridge. I also asked them about the squirrely tax treatment that they had provided, as well as whether they were working with the other defendants. And as of, as of today, they have not given me a substantive response to feel them out, which has not changed. And that kind of goes along with my claim that they're stonewall stonewalling, et cetera. Every, everything they've done has been consistent with that. And I believe that they're aligned and working together in some fashion. So to feel them out on March 21st, 2023, I reached out to them and gave them, in essence, one last opportunity to come clean. I told them that their position was, and this is a direct quote, BS and that their client would be less happy about things on Monday. And what I was thinking is after my oppositions were filed and I raised arguments about certain of the conduct and referenced uh, the uh, new FAQ that was put out on 316. Um, they responded on March 24th. And this response, I think, came from FINRA counsel, and basically they had no responsibility, and how dare you threaten us. That was basically the, the argument. And I was not threatening. I was giving them the opportunity to avoid the embarrassment of 
one, their incompetence becoming public, and two, the allegations of criminal misconduct coming out. But they elected not to. I guess they feel otherwise. And uh, they thought I was bluffing, I guess, even though I had to respond to their motions. But whatever. So I filed their oppositions to three motions to dismiss. They're very similar. Um, but I'm going to deal with FINRAs because that deals with the immunity issue besides the other thing. And first of all, uh, the my opposition to the or, or the motions to dismiss were filed on March 15th, 2023. It's interesting that the FAQ came out on March 16th, 2023. Could that have been a coincidence? Yes, it's possible. However, I'm wondering if the information in the FAQ had come out, whether FINRA would have been able to make the motion to dismiss that they filed on March 15th in the same way, or perhaps counsel might be subject to sanctions. And I'm just speculating on that, but I find the timing uh, of that very coincidental, and I'm it's bolstered by the fact, and I'll get to this, is the revised one, which I haven't seen, but I'll get to that later. So in my op opposition, um, I, I reference uh, the disturbing argument that defendants claim that there's not sufficient facts are alleged, but in fact they stonewall and don't provide discovery. So isn't that to be expected? And in essence, what I say is, you know, what, notwithstanding whatever they, they say, this is not a case where we don't know if someone's been harmed, but this is like a surgeon leaving a sponge in during surgery and la later having to go back in and deal, deal with it. No one can argue that, that this is settled and then that anybody got anything of value. Uh, all, that, all that can be seen is there's something up. And in, in the FAQ of 316, and I have not read the revised version, coincidentally, and this is what I mentioned above, put out the same day my opposition to their motion to dismiss was due. But the situation speaks for itself, and no one can claim as all all is well, and it's effed up. So it's not disputed that this is effed up. So I point out in the um, oppositions, I point out allegations in the complaint that I made on information and belief, and that's uh, uh, kind of legal jargon saying, I don't have firsthand knowledge, so this is what I believe based on information I've received. And some of that was with regard to the short positions. And lo and behold, in the FAQ on March 16th and in other communications, we've now been advised that there's short positions in NextBridge. So my information belief turned out to be correct. I referenced the seeming alteration of evidence in Florida regarding the deletion code in Rose's case. I referenced that have ref that Fidelity has even ref recently referenced that this matter is not settled besides the fact of the seeming acknowledgement of the short positions. I reference there is that that the information is that FINRA issued the U3 halt after the dark pool trading on either late uh, December 8th or early December 9th Dark pool is kind of separate and apart from the trading that retail investors get to do, large, often institutional blocks of trades that are made um, and can be done off hours. And it showed apparently that MMTLP would open 100 times plus what the closing price was on 12.8 when trading happened on 12.9, if it had traded. And even though, obviously, uh, we believe and it seems clear that FINRA never intended it to trade. When they found out it was going to open up at 300 bucks plus, that made it an easy call. I make various arguments against the immunity claims, and these immunity claims would only apply to DTCC and FINRA, not to Fidelity. But in essence, you know, summarizing, I indicate that I think that criminal misconduct is not regular regulatory behavior. Just justifying any immunity. And I 
if a judge ruled against me on that, and you know, we'll have to see, I would probably challenge that on appeal too. I, I just don't think it's in the interests of the citizens of this country to permit incompetent regular regulators to also be insulated from their criminal misconduct also. I also kind of indicate how pathetic it is that Fidelity thinks that by acknowledging that they were only incompetent as to their regulatory duties, that they are somehow immune. That's their defense and position without any solution or any responsibility. That's, that really is pathetic. And, you know, again, we just saw a similar situation with Silicon Valley Bank where regulators are just incompetent and don't do their jobs, and it costs taxpayers billions and hundreds of billions of dollars, which impacts our daily lives. I assert uh, in the oppositions that there are various crimes that appear to have been committed or suggested in aiding and abetting tax fraud, tax evasion, and obstruction of justice, all the blocking and all the actions to block their actions. I also suggest that the U3 halt smells foul. And this has been my view all along. Um, besides everything else and the timing of the halt, which didn't make any sense even on that day, if, if the shorts had not been tipped prior to December 8th, that the halt would be imposed, and if they were in the same position as everyone else with their knowledge of the facts, and they understood there were claims of millions or hundreds of millions of synthetic shorts shares, plus other quote-unquote legitimate short shares, no matter synthetic or real, all of those positions would have to be closed out by the 12th and the cost would be high and there clearly wouldn't be enough shares available. And in part, this was verified by communications on 321 or 323 with regarding to the 100X information. So those shorts who had not been tipped and if they believed there was going to be a crush to borrow shares to cover and a huge cost, and there would be an increased risk and potential cost of holding shorts, period, on December 8th, they would not have increased the risk by shorting more. That makes no sense, absolute no logical sense, and I don't think any jury would buy that argument Unless, and only, if guys like Ari wanted to lose more money, etc. So, the only logical answer is, they were tipped. And that's why it was shorted, and they knew they would never have to pay the piper, because Nextbridge could not trade. So, the U3 story that I claim to be BS, is BS. One additional thing I've requested throughout in, in my declaration, where I go through the FAQ, that the court should order discovery of all this nonsense. I don't think I used the term nonsense to the court, but I suggested, you know, there's more than enough here, and with the FAQ, we really need discovery to kind of sort this out. So uh, the opposition was filed, the oppositions were filed, and there'll be some reply brief that is filed, and then the court can hold a hearing or won't hold a hearing, depending on that. If it was state court, they'd almost always hold a hearing, but this is federal court, so they don't have to. So they could just issue a ruling if they decide on the papers. If the court grants the motions to dismiss, they can either grant them outright or grant it with leave to amend. Leave to amend means that changes can be made, alterations, based on probably on the new matter that I cited in the FAQ. Or else it can be dismissed outright. If it's dismissed outright, then it could be a, appealed to the Ninth Circuit, in my case. We'll know more towards the latter part of April when I hope to get a ruling. As, as to fidelity, whether in this action or arbitration, 
there will, there will be proceedings. And I tend to proceed with regard to MMAT, with regard to my account in general, and the actions of Fidelity independent of this MMTLP matter. I'm not going to let them off the hook. So I will keep you updated as we go along. Uh, my next video, I'll discuss uh, the, uh, uh, the arbitration, potential arbitration, pluses and minuses, and uh, we can take it from there. So again, please subscribe, share, like, and uh, talk to you soon. Be well.